This video is picking up right where the previous video left off. We're still in part 110, chap 12, then 11, and the vast majority of the code that I'm going to show you in this video is going to work exactly the way it does here in MATLAB. It's going to work the same in Octave, and I'll make little notes. I'll say something when it doesn't. There are some PowerPoint slides associated with this code right here, but I looked them over and I don't think they're that important. I will link to that PowerPoint document in the video description if you want to check out some of those slides. So I'm just going to focus on the MATLAB code. And in this first section, I just want to emphasize that this right here is a vector of characters. It's a vector of symbols, and we can interact with it in the same way that we would interact with a vector of numbers. So I put Holly into the variable named H, and I can index what is the first letter, what is the second, third, fourth, and fifth, and I display them all out right there. I can just display out what's the third through fifth letters and get LLY right there. Now, one important thing to note is that a character vector with the apostrophes is not actually the same thing as using the quotation marks, and it's confusing because the output looks very similar when you just display them. Now, I had to even look up what the difference was, and the uh, reference that I used is this link right here, and in a nutshell, the difference is that single quotes define one of those character vectors, right? If there are n symbols, then it's a one by n vector. Whereas the double quotes define a string array, a kind of container for a character vector. I think of it as sort of the difference between an array and an object in an object-oriented programming language like Java or like with Python. You can read more about the distinction right here, but for the most part, you basically just want to use the character vectors when you have the opportunity to. They are simpler and they occupy less space in memory. If we look at our workspace briefly, we'll see that the character vector k only occupies 26 bytes of memory, whereas the string occupies 166. There are, however, some other useful features of strings, which I've never really dived into, and so I can't even tell you about because I'm not really that familiar with them. But you may need to use strings at various points in time. I'm going to stick with characters, though, because they're simpler, and I find them easy to use, and they meet my needs. Uh, everything that I've ever done in MATLAB, I've just done with the character vectors. And one of the things that I like about them is that characters are very easily converted to integers. In fact, every symbol has an integer representation. And so in this code right here, I use the int16 function to convert the fifth character in my Holly vector to a 16-bit integer. And in fact, characters are represented in memory using 16 bits, or 2 bytes. So, the letter Y from Holly is represented by the number 121. Some other letters, capital A represented by 65, capital B 66, capital C 67, lowercase a 97. And I can also use the char function to convert from the number 97 into the character A. I can go the other direction. And all of these come from a very common encoding for text, which is the ASCII encoding. So checking out this web page right here, you can find for every single symbol, what is the numeric equivalent? And in fact, other things as well, like HTML and, and octal and hexadecimal and binary, if you want. The first few symbols probably won't mean anything to you, like the null character and a bell alert. And like, what the heck is this stuff? But if you scroll down to number 32 here, you get into some stuff that's more common, like a blank space, which is represented by the number 32, exclamation mark represented by a 33. Continuing further on down, your numeric digits start represented by 48, and so on to 57. And you might think like, oh, well, I mean, shouldn't zero be represented by a zero? Well, when ASCII was created, it was decided that sort of these uh, less common or uh, various things like the start of text, the end of text, end of transmission, these non-visual values, non-visual symbols would be represented by the small values instead. I don't exactly know why that was the decision that was made, but that's the decision that was made. So we got our numbers starting around 48 right here, and going even further down, we got the alphabetical letters starting around 65 for the capitals, and then uh, 97 for the lowercase. Back to MATLAB here, we can add numeric values 
to the numeric representation of the symbols and get other characters, other symbols. So here, capital A, I add 32 to it and convert it back to a character, and I get lowercase a. As I said before, all this code works in exactly the same way in Octave. However, some of these little conversions here may throw a warning in Octave that does not occur in MATLAB. It's just letting you know that you're converting between types. I don't know if it actually occurs here, but I know it occurs later on in this code. A Caesar cipher is a very, very basic form of encryption, and I'm going to demonstrate it here with some MATLAB code. So I have the very, very important and secret uh, phrase here, MATLAB is fun, and I want to encrypt it so no one can know what I'm talking about. All I do is I put it into a variable, I add two, and even maybe just translating it to numeric values is enough encryption. I mean, if you're using something this basic, like you might as well just use the number and nothing else. But we're going to do something a little bit more sophisticated, and we're going to add two. And so here are the numbers in MATLAB is fun after I've added two to them. And then when I try and display it out as text using the char function, I get this nonsense right here. Now, I mean, this is just like such a basic you know, encryption, like I said, like this is the sort of thing you find on the back of a kid's cereal box. But nonetheless, uh, we can do it in MATLAB. And so I transmit my secret message and the person that's receiving it knows to subtract two from the message. I display out those numbers and then they get the secret message that I sent them that MATLAB is fun. Now, as you saw on the ASCII table here, the first three columns were numeric. In fact, I'm going to scroll up to the top and the first one is decimal. The next one, oct for octal. The next one, hex for hexadecimal, bin for binary. And let's look at that a little bit more. Uh, digress into that. It's not particularly related to characters, but I think it's worth mentioning here. So here, decimal numbers, a vector from 0 to 16. I'm just going to run that code, display it out. There it is. There's a function in MATLAB, dec to bin, to convert from decimal to binary. Run that code right here. And we see some binary numbers. By the way, it is very easy to learn to add in binary. You know, start with 0 or whatever. Add 1, great there's a one in the lowest digit, add one again. Now, binary doesn't have a number two, and one plus one, well, how do we represent that? Well, you carry it over to the next more significant digit. And so we have a one here, and just zero remainder right here. Add one to this number. Well, zero plus one is one. Great, so now it looks like this. It looks like 11, but it's actually three. Add one to that. Well, one plus one, Ah, well, we don't really have a 2, so carry the 1 over. Oh, but then we have a 1 plus 1 again. No problem. Carry it over again. And now we have a 1 here to represent the value of 4. And so on. You keep just adding 1 or, or add other values if you like. There is also a function in MATLAB, dec to hex, to convert from decimal to hexadecimal. And so here's hexadecimal right here. If you've never heard of this before, this is a number system that has 16 digits. And you might think like, well, what the heck symbols do they use for those other digits? And what they do is they simply borrow from the alphabet. So if you've ever seen what looks like a number, but it's got like A through F mixed in, you were probably reading a number in hexadecimal. And so the way this works is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Yes, it looks like 10, but it represents 16. Now, another thing you might have noticed with both the binary and the hexadecimal is these like zeros to the left of our number. That's simply a way of indicating, hey, we're not in Kansas anymore. We're not using the typical decimal system, so just be aware of that. Because you wouldn't want to, for example, back to the binary here, look at this and think, Oh, that's a thousand. We don't want people to be confused. So the leading zero is a hint. Hey, you might not be in a base 10 system. So just be aware of that. Anyway, my next section of code right here, I just put all those into a table and display them out. So there is a table of decimal, binary, and hexadecimal values. That code right there will not work in octave, but only because the table function uh, is not provided in octave. All this previous stuff right here works perfectly fine in octave. Now here I'm going to take a further digression into number systems, partly because I think it's very interesting. If you'd like to hear a dedicated video just about number systems, 
Here is a link to it right here. I'll try and remember to also include this link in the video description. It's one of my videos, so it's about uh, similar content, but it goes into more detail. And I use it for my Java class that I teach. But let's demonstrate some of the same stuff from that video in MATLAB. So here you've got your basic decimal number system. I've got some arbitrary number, 1,562. First of all, I want you to think about and really process how we say that number. 1,000. 500. This doesn't follow the pattern, but let's just call it 610 right now and 2. That tells you something about the base that we're using, base 10. And there's a pattern to that. Of course, the pattern is 1, 10, 100, 1,000 as you move from right to left through the digits. But you can also look at it as 10 to the 0 for the first digit, 10 to the 1 for the second, 10 squared for the third, 10 cubed for the fourth. It starts at 0, so like the first one is 0, and then they feel like they're off by 1. But if you get into computer programming, that will become more natural. Most languages, not MATLAB, start the counting system at 0. And there's a huge similarity between the way we do decimal and the way we do binary, if you want the specific term for it. These are both radix number systems. Here's a number in binary. Now, if you've never read binary before, you're just like, yeah, I don't know, it's ones and zeros, not sure what that stands for. But it stands for something very similar to what the decimal system stood for. This one right here is one times one. And we add to that one times not 10, but times two. And then we add to that, well, zero, times four, and add to that one times eight, and add to that one times 16. And there's a pattern there as well. It's two to the zero for the first digit, two to the one for the second digit, two cubed for the third. Nope, see, I said that wrong. <laughs> two squared for the third, two cubed for the fourth, two to the fourth for the fifth. And so whichever way you represent it, there is this very stable pattern that you can learn if you, I don't know, need to read binary numbers uh, just, you know, by hand or, or, you know, by your own human brain. But of course, we can also use the MATLAB functions to calculate them. And I'm doing it here just to show you that all these things are, in fact, the same. And they're 27. This represents the number 27. That's why those are being printed out here. Now, vectors and matrices in MATLAB, which are really the same thing, I just use vectors to refer to one-dimensional matrices, can only hold one type of information. But what happens when we try and force two different types into the same vector? So here, I've got the letter A again, as I've used as an example earlier in this video. I got A as a numeric type, a double type, 97, right? If I just add one, it's a B. And I'm going to try and cram into a vector the letter A followed by the number three. And what happens? Well, I get this right here with this symbol, this blank square, which is basically MATLAB's way of saying, hey, I don't know how to represent a three visually. Because if we go back to that ASCII table, we see that the number three is supposed to represent end of text. Okay, that's not a visual symbol that we're familiar with, right? So anyway, what MATLAB does is it just displays this square and then, yeah, we're done. When I do this in Octave, it works pretty much the same way, except it will display a warning, which I kind of think MATLAB should do personally, but it doesn't. Now, if I put a different number in, 100 say, I get AD, because 100 represents the letter D, and MATLAB is automatically going to convert all the numbers when you try and share space with uh, some symbols to the symbol that that number represents, to a printable character that uh, we can display out there. Right? If I put in a 97 and rerun it, well, then I get another A, because 97 is the number that is used to represent the symbol A. Performing addition is also going to perform a conversion. If I start with a symbol and I add some number to it, MATLAB is going to assume that I want to convert to a numeric type. Up here, it just assumed I wanted to convert to the character type. So that's just some built-in assumptions that may be different in other languages. Actually, most languages with uh, types just won't let you convert back and forth. You have to like run particular code to do a conversion. They won't just like do it on the fly like this. Although some languages will. I think Python will do some of these conversions, but I don't remember off the top of my head the assumptions that Python makes. 
And here we have a question from the book, MATLAB for Engineers, 5th edition, but I'm just gonna fill in my answers to it. Like it tells you to create a character array or vector of your name. So I do that in two different ways just to demonstrate it. All right, so they did both display out the same way. They are in fact equivalent. This is just a shorthand way, so we don't have to type all this out. And then also, what is the decimal equivalent of the letter G? What number represents the letter G? And I just do three different conversions here just to show you that they're all the same. I mean, they're, they're different. They're actually different types. And if we look at the workspace, we'll see that they occupy different amounts of memory. But you get the same number every time. Here, and this is somewhat just like a review of for loops because I often find that my students struggle with for loops. But here's some code where I'm going to convert from a lowercase phrase to an uppercase phrase. Now, there's better ways to do it than what I'm going to show you right here. But again, I'm just kind of also reviewing for loops. So I've got a vector named M, and in that vector is the data for the symbols representing MATLAB. I'm going to pre-allocate a new vector, which I'm going to name uppercase, and then I'm going to create a new character vector, just full of zeros, of the same length as my character vector named M right here. My for loop is going to have a loop control variable named index, and it's going to loop from 1 to the length of M, just 1 through 6. I'm going to copy out a particular letter from the vector m into a variable conveniently named letter. I'm going to subtract 32 because that is how you would convert from a lowercase to an uppercase letter using the ASCII encoding, ASCII, -I, as I showed on that web page. And then I'm going to convert it back to a character and stick it into this vector named uppercase at position index and then display it out. And I've already run the code right there. Now, another way you could do this, and this is just also kind of a hey, did you know you could do this with vectors example, is the same setup right here, except uppercase starts right here, not as a length six vector, but as just a length zero vectors, an empty vector of characters. And I'm gonna loop directly over the letters, M-A-T-L-A-B, and I'm gonna set uppercase equal to whatever I've already put in uppercase, the first time through the loop, nothing, followed by that particular letter converted to uppercase, subtract 32, convert it back to a character. And then the next time through the loop, uppercase will be M, and I'll be adding in the letter A after the M. And then the third time through the loop, I'll be adding to MA the letter T, but converted to uppercase. And if I run it, it's the exact same result. But honestly, here's like the better and easier way to do it, at least in MATLAB. We just take that whole vector, we subtract 32, MATLAB applies the minus 32 to every single symbol, and then we convert it back to a character vector. Now, character vectors and matrices can be difficult to manage because, like with numeric matrices, every single row has to have the same length. This error was generated on purpose. I'm going to get to that in a second. But first, I want you to take a look at this right here. Now, this is probably not how I wanted to organize all of these names. But I did it in what seems like a sensible way. I set a variable equal to the name, comma, the next name, comma, the next name, and so on. But that actually just puts all of these together adjacent to each other horizontally as if they were just numbers and I was just concatenating together a bunch of numeric vectors. If I want to stack these names vertically in a matrix, well, here's one way to do it. But what I had to do is I had to add a blank space after Holly to make it the same length as Stephen, and I had to add a bunch of blank spaces after Al to make it the same length also of Stephen and now of the longer version of Holly. And if I don't add those blank spaces, well, I get an error when I try and put it together. This is the line that generated this error here. Now, the char function can help you fix this. So I just say my variable equals char parentheses and then all the names that I want to put in there. Let's run this code right here. All right, and we see my matrix of all the names. Now, when I highlight over it, notice the blank spaces. Beethoven has no blank spaces after it. But Heidi does, David does, Megan does, Steven, all these do. Because they've all been modified by the char function to be the same length as Beethoven. This is a matrix of characters. I can index into row 1, column 5, and get that Y out of Holly right there. Or row 1, column 6, and get this blank space right here. Row 1, column 7, also a blank space. Row 6, column 6, you can go up and check where this letter O came from but it's, it's literally just a matrix of characters, which, as we've seen, are very easy to translate into numeric types if we want to or need to. Char continues to make things easier for us 
uh, if we know how to use it. So here, uh, I've got all my same names as before, Holly and Al and Steven and whatnot, but I've got these numbers, maybe they're like test grades, that I want to associate with these people. I want to put them next to the people. And if I just try and create a new matrix, it's actually a matrix, I shouldn't have named it my table, with the names, comma, next column, the grades, well, then the grades get converted into their ASCII equivalents. And that's not really what I wanted. So the solution is I'm just going to use num to string to say, no, 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 no. I don't want 98 converted to the letter that 98 represents, which is B. I want you to convert 98 to the symbols, the characters, 9 and 8. And that's what num to string does. So then when I display out my better table, which is actually a matrix, I get these results right here. Now, one downside is that Beethoven doesn't have a space between the name and the number, but we'll fix that in an example that's coming right up. You might think this is not very useful, but it's actually super useful. Suppose you need to generate a bunch of file names. You're generating all this data, and you'd also like your code to automatically save that data into a file. Well, here's just some very simple example code that's going to generate some random 2x2 two two matrices and save them into a file that the file name was generated using the numeric values of the loop. We're going to create my data 1 through 5 dot mat with this code right here. So I run it, keep an eye on the current folder right here. I'll zoom in on it and I run this code. And there we go. I got these files that were generated. And then in the next section, we can read data back in from those files using the load function right here. So my data num to string dot mat is going to be my file name. I'm going to load in that file and then display out the results of those matrices. And there they are. And they're just randomly generated. So, you know, they're all just arbitrary numbers, but it's the demonstration that's important. And of course, you can do the exact same thing with Excel. You can use the write table function or write matrix to write data out to file. So I will do that here, control enter. And now these five Excel files have been created. And then you can see them there in the current folder. Now, write table won't work in Octave, but you can use uh, a similar, you can use the DLM write in Octave to write matrix data to file instead. And here, I'm just going to read that data back in from file using read matrix. Uh, in, again, in Octave, you would use like DLM read as opposed to DLM write. I think I might have misset it here. So this would be DLM write for writing data to file, DLM read if you're in Octave. But here, we'll read it in from file. And there it is. And again, it's just random data. So the numbers themselves don't really matter. So this is a practice exercise that comes from MATLAB for Engineers 5th edition. I'm just going to run through it relatively quickly here. Suppose that I want to display out all the planets. Yeah, I know Pluto's not counted anymore, but this is old code. And I want to display out their type. Are they rocky or are they gaseous? And we want to number them. And this is a matrix of characters. So one of the cool little tricks I can use is that I can create a vector of just blank spaces, transpose it to make it vertical, and then insert it as a column between the planet names and the planet types, which I already also filled in with extra spaces, right? Needed some extra spaces here to make Pluto as long as Neptune, Mars as long as Jupiter, by using the char function, right? So I use the char function to make these all the same length, and then I just put them right next to each other as if they were numeric types. All right, and finally I display it all out. And again, this is a matrix. What is in row three, column four? Row three, column four, it's the T of Earth. There's the T right there. This next section is re-emphasizing that you can only put one type into a vector matrix, but there are a variety of different types that you can put in. Now, I made the mistake of forgetting that there was one little symbolic section, and I am recording this on my home computer, which won't actually run this, but uh, I can just run this section right here and create a logical array. But here, you can do this as long as you have the symbolics package in MATLAB, you can create a vector of symbolic equations or expressions. This code does work, just not on my computer because I didn't pay for the expensive version of MATLAB. But anyway, I'll just delete that and quickly run the other part. And there it is right there, a vector of logicals.
So this video was a little bit scattershot. We had character information, we had numeric information, and also just reminders about matrices and vectors. That's the end for this video. In the next one, I'm going to talk about sparse arrays, which I just think is kind of a cool, interesting topic, is a good review topic for uh, my students. And anyway, that'll be what's up next in the subsequent video.